Anyway, good. Okay, so um, let's get started. I uh, want to review uh, what I talked about last time, and maybe uh, it was a little bit floundering at the end, so let's clarify. Um, so uh, we're trying to make our way towards uh, uh, talking about twisted bilayer graphene, and so we first have to understand a few important features of the single layer graphene. Um, so last time uh, uh, I discussed some things which you might have had in a, a solid state physics course. Um, you can write this nice tight binding model down for uh, these p electrons of graphene on the honeycomb lattice. And uh, what you find is that you have a pair of conduction and valence bands that touch. You notice them touching in the forbidden region here. I, I edited a little bit the x. Um, uh, and they touch uh, at two points, the corners of the Rillon zone, the K and K prime points, um, in the form of Dirac cones. Uh, and because the energy scale of these bands is so big, it's you know uh, 16 electron volts from top to bottom of the uh, valence to the conduction. Um, every physical property you can possibly think of basically is very low energy compared to this. Um, so uh, for all extensive intensive purposes, all we really need to know about these bands are the behavior near these uh, uh, band touchings near K and K prime, where they're well approximated by uh, Dirac uh, equation. Um, in equations, we can write this like this. I uh, introduced some Pauli matrices. These tau x and tau y describe the uh, sublattice uh, degree of freedom, and mu uh, is uh, labeling whether uh, mu z equals 1 is the k point and mu z equals minus 1 is the k prime point. We we'll call, call that valley. Um, they have a certain Dirac velocity, which is about a 300th of the speed of light. Um, if you go to, from momentum to coordinate representation, these become derivatives. Uh, you can ask the question, how do we know that this is a good description? Well, there are many ways. These days, there are also photo emission experiments, which directly uh, image the dispersion of Dirac electrons on graphene. Uh, quantum oscillations is a nice one. Um, it's one of the earliest ways it was seen. Um, and to see what's unique about Dirac electrons from the point of view of quantum oscillations, it's nice to solve the Landau level problem. Um, I'm not going to do it here for the sake of time, but it's, it's a textbook problem. You can find it, for example, in the reviews of modern physics article I referenced the last time. Uh, all you do is you take uh, this Dirac equation, let's say just mu z equals 1 here, replace all the derivatives by the um, minimal coupling covariant derivative, grad minus i e a, you choose a gauge, a Landau gauge, whatever you like, um, and it's a, it's a simple equation. Um, you can solve it for normalizable solutions, and you find similar to Landau's original solution of Landau levels, where he found evenly spaced harmonic oscillator levels. Uh, here you find, again, completely flat levels, but they're not evenly spaced. Now they're spaced with a spacing that grows like the square root of the number, and they go, they, they go from minus infinity to infinity because, of course, the Dirac dispersion is uh, um, you know, it's not bounded. Uh, the most important feature here is that there's a zeroth Landau level, uh, which sits right at the Fermi level of the charge neutral system. And then there's a plus one and minus one level, and then they become further and further apart in energy. Um, uh, uh, this spacing is determined by the velocity divided by the magnetic length. And you can think about the magnetic, magnetic length as, as roughly defining the area through which one flux quantum threads. Okay? Um, this also uh, gives you uh, the degeneracy of a Landau level. Basically, for every, uh, every flux quantum that threads through the sample, you have one uh, state per Landau level, um, uh, uh, up to the degeneracy of the system. So that's a solution for one Dirac uh, cone. In fact, in graphene, we have four Dirac cones, because for every momentum, we have two spin species, and we also have two valleys. Uh, um, so. Uh, uh, this gives rise to a, a slightly unconventional integer quantum Hall effect. So uh, for the interest of time, I'm not really reviewing integer quantum Hall effect. I guess that uh, Jean Noël must have reviewed it uh, in his lectures somewhat, yes. So it's like the most uh, uh, well-tested and storied example of a topological system. Um, uh, the theory of the integer quantum Hall effect tells you that every time you uh, move the Fermi level through a Landau level, uh, the, uh, when the Fermi level is, is between 
uh, in a gap between Landau levels, you have a, a quantized uh, Hall conductivity, and that quantized Hall conductivity jumps by E squared over H uh, every time you bring the Fermi level through a Landau level. In this case, the Landau levels are fourfold degenerate because uh, of spin and valley, so the Hall conductivity jumps by four E squared over H. The peculiar feature is that at charge neutrality, when you nominally have no electrons, of course we have lots of electrons, there's one electron per carbon atom, so it's not really no electrons, but nominally no electrons compared to charge neutrality, uh, you're actually in the middle of a Landau level. So that's kind of not a quantiz quantization condition, okay? Um, you have to move a little off uh, to either fill uh, half the Landau level with electrons or fill or deplete half the Landau level with holes. Um, so that jump of four, which is the same jump as any other Landau level, actually takes you from two to minus two. Okay, so that's, this is the most peculiar feature that allows you to identify Dirac electrons in graphene, uh, is that there, um, you have this, uh, this funny sequence of uh, quantum Hall states starting with two rather than four, even though you have fourfold degenerate uh, Landau levels. You know, the graphene people like to call this half integer quantum Hall effect, but of course two is an integer, it's only half of four. So uh, it's not that, not that cool. Um, so you have this funny sequence, two, six, the next one would be 10. Um, one can also see this uh, uh, in what's called a fan diagram. This is sort of advantageous because you could make this kind of diagram even when you're not at quite low enough temperature or high enough fields to see full quantization. You just see oscillations in the resistivity. Uh, and you mark, uh, for example, the minimum in the resistivity, which generally occur between uh, Landau levels. Um, these will follow straight lines in the magnetic field density plane, correspond to that condition of filling Landau levels. Uh, I got a little confused last time by how I'd labeled them. These integers they correspond to the Hall conductivities. They're actually the inverse of the slope on this plot, okay? Um, uh, you can easily see, because this is just the condition that the N is the number of filled Landau levels, basically, so sigma xy divided by the uh, integer quantum Hall quantum uh, times the number of states per Landau level, B over phi naught, okay? Um, uh, this is actually related to a famous formula called Strata's formula, which relates uh, the density to a uh, magnetic field uh, via the Hall conductivity. It's a very general result that holds when, when adiabaticity is valid, which means generally when the system is in a gap, okay? Um, so th these kind of plots are used heavily in twisted bilayer graphene uh, to try to analyze what's going on. This is, in with when you have a single layer twisted bilayer graphene, it's a very low energy system. There's not that many measurements you can do. Almost always transport are the, are the go-to measurements. Um, and you know, we don't, at this point, it, photo emissions, something like this is very difficult to do um, for reasons we'll get to. Uh, but one can do this type of measurements, and by identifying these Landau fans, one learns something about the degeneracy of the Landau levels. So this, the fact that this is 2, 6, 10 is telling us we have fourfold degeneracy of Landau levels, and the fact that this is 2 and not 4, it's, not, it's shifted symmetric around 0, is telling us we have some Dirac-like structure here, okay? Um, questions? Yeah. Not, not from Pierce, but... Uh, Yes. Yeah, so that is the way one varies the density. You vary the... It does, basically, yeah, yeah, via capacitance. So they, they have to do some work to determine how to normalize this density, but that, that can be done, okay? Um. Yeah, I'll mention that, I guess, if, uh, uh, I haven't done the bilayer yet, but... Yes, absolutely. So this, is, uh, this has been done for, uh, uh, one of the things we'll certainly get to today is an untwisted bilayer that has a slightly different structure than this, and you can see that structure again through these type of plots. Um, the next degree of complexity is twisted bilayers, and really for twisted bilayers, this is almost to date the, 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 certainly by far the strongest probe we have of experimentally trying to know what the electronic structure looks like. Okay, and, uh, and to be perfectly honest, it's very rich and we don't understand it, okay? <laughs> uh, okay, um, but we'll get there. So now I wanna continue this graphene review 
Um, I'm not going to try to be comprehensive. If you look at that RMP article, it's, I don't know, 100 pages, and that's 10 years old. So, um, But there are a few things that you really should think about this review as what do you need to know to try to make this step to Twisted Byler. And the thing I think you need to know, and that's a bit of a matter of opinion, uh, is uh, that graphene, uh, because it consists of Dirac electrons, has a lot of incipient uh, uh, insulators, uh, at least theoretically, nearby it. Okay, um, so uh, graphene in this with this Dirac structure is is neither uh, a metal or an insulator. Okay, a metal has a Fermi surface, has a finite density of states at the Fermi energy, um, uh, and an insulator has a gap at the Fermi energy. The, uh, uh, graphene is neither. Um, in theory, it, it could be made insulating by a small perturbation to the band structure. Okay? Um, by actually various perturbations. Um, that either doesn't or rarely happens, which is because, uh, again, of these very high energy scales in graphene, it's very robust, we'll kind of get to that. Um, uh, uh, but these sorts of, uh, Nearby insulators, so incipient, if you don't know this word in English, I guess means uh, uh, almost realized, about to be born. I might use a nascent. There must be a word like this in French, naissant or something like that. Anyway, um, okay, uh, about to be born. Um, and this comes back to a comment I made the last time uh, uh, in before coming to experiment and talking about how you can actually measure this thing. Uh, you know, we ask the question, how do you know this is correct? And as a theorist, you might wonder if this is correct because uh, it's actually not so easy to make bands touch. Um, there's an old problem, I think due to Wigner, who first thought about this, um, ask in quantum mechanics, if I have just a quantum mechanical system, uh, and I want to vary parameters in the Hamiltonian of that system to try to bring two levels together. Um, yeah, you can ask, generically, how many parameters do I have to vary in order to get two levels to cross in a quantum system? Um, and in order to do that, to get two levels to cross, uh, if you can think about it like this, it turns out you need, generically, three parameters have to be tuned to make two levels cross. And the reason is once two levels get very close together, and you have some hope of them crossing, you can kind of throw out all the other levels that are far away in energy. And then you have an effective, uh, two-dimensional system that's described in quantum mechanics by a two-by-two two matrix. And to make the two levels cross in that matrix, uh, you have to make uh, the off-diagonal elements equal to zero. And they're complex, so that's two parameters. Uh, and you have to make the diagonal elements equal. If they're non-equal, then the levels aren't the same. So in general, you have to tune three parameters. Um, in our two-dimensional system, we have two parameters, kx and ky. Uh, so uh, it's not generically the case that bands cross in two dimensions. You need some special condition. Um, and uh, indeed, we can see it. You know, if we consider our two by two Dirac Hamiltonian, we can imagine taking our Hamiltonian here. Let's write our one particle Hamiltonian is this thing, you know, uh, V kx tau x plus V ky tau y. I'll just consider a single Dirac. So mu z equals one here. This would work for any Dirac equation and I want to add to it a perturbation, let's say h prime, the most generic perturbation I can add would be uh, a constant plus something proportional to tau x plus something proportional to tau y plus something proportional to tau z. Okay. Um, and I can ask about the effect of this on the Dirac point. Well, A doesn't do anything to the Dirac point, just shifts the whole system up and down. Uh, B will actually shift the Dirac point to a slightly different position in Kx, okay? Because if, if I add B, I can uh, just absorb it in here. I write V Kx plus B. There's still a touching when Kx is minus B over V. Uh, similar thing with C, it just shifts it in the Y direction. D causes problems, D actually opens a gap, okay? D is this diagonal. It would make the diagonal elements non-equal, okay? So these are not so important. These do not open up a gap. 
This one, we'll change its notation and we'll call it M. This is the important one. This is called a Dirac mass because in relativistic uh, quantum physics, if we add this term to the Dirac equation, it's called a mass. It would describe an, an electron, well, in three dimensions, it would describe an electron. Um, uh, so if we include this term, then uh, what will happen is our Dirac dispersion, epsilon versus k, will switch to this, we become rounded. Uh, we get epsilon as plus or minus b squared, k squared, plus m squared. So m becomes the gap, uh, or half the gap. Okay. Um, good. OK. Uh, so why doesn't this happen in, in graphene? Well, it, ha it, it could happen, but it's not allowed by the symmetry of graphene. So if you think about what this uh, mass term would do, something proportional to tau z, ask what it means physically, remember that tau z equals 1 uh, labels the a sub lattice and tau z equals minus 1 labels the b sub lattice. So putting this mass term means I'm assigning different energies to the a and b sub lattice. Okay. So this is sort of breaking the symmetry between a and b sub lattices. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, Let's think about it a little bit more carefully. To think about it a little bit more carefully, we need to include the valley. Um, so uh, when we think about the valley, uh, we have a Dirac cone over here, uh, over here at plus k, and over here at minus k. We have two of them. Okay? We can add masses to either of them. Uh, a way to write that is we could add a mass which is independent of valley like this, or we could add another mass uh, which uh, depends on the valley, which is opposite sign for the two valleys. Okay. Um, so uh, we can ask how, uh, what the symmetries are of these terms. And, we f and actually, e either one of these terms, if we were to allow it, would, would open up a gap. This would open up the same mass at both the right and left valley. And this would open up opposite mass, but you see that dispersion doesn't depend on the sign of the mass. Okay. Um, uh, turns out they're both disallowed uh, by different symmetries. Um, so uh, one important symmetry of the uh, of graphene is inversion or C2 symmetry. So uh, oh, I guess I've been drawing it like this. Be careful about convention. So here's a you know, one hexagon of the graphene lattice. Um, uh, and one symmetry of the system is, is inversion. In two dimensions, inversion, you know, which changes the sign of x and y, is actually the same as a pi rotation. Um, uh, so we can also think about this as a C2 two-fold rotation around the axis here. So rotating by 180 degrees, we'll take this site here to this site here, and these are on opposite sublattices. Okay. Uh, but this inversion also interchanges the valleys because it takes k to minus k. So under this, uh, under this symmetry, we have uh, tau z goes to minus tau z because it changes the sublattices and it also changes the valleys. Uh, so you can see that uh, m0 breaks this, uh, but m1 does not. Um, but there's another important symmetry, uh, which is time reversal. Okay, so then we, we don't apply a magnetic field, don't have any spins coupling to our system, et cetera. Time reversal uh, just takes momentum to minus momentum. Okay. And so consequently, it interchanges the valleys, but of course it doesn't interchange the sublattices. So time reversal just takes mu z to minus mu z uh, and this is the opposite. M0 uh, preserves this, is invariant, but M1 is odd. So for you know, freestanding graphene, we have both these symmetries. 
uh, and both these terms are prohibited. Um, we can imagine, theorists like to imagine, that these symmetries might be broken spontaneously by interactions. Again, this doesn't happen for ordinary graphene. If it did, what would it mean? Um, so uh, what it would mean uh, if we had the M0 uh, non-zero, what it would mean is that uh, this would, again, preserve time reversal symmetry. Uh, but break the symmetry between the, uh, between the A and the B sublattices, break this inversion symmetry. So you should think about this as kind of a, a density wave. Um, this is a, would be kind of a charge density wave. For one particular sign, let's say M0 positive, we might be having a little bit more uh, density on the A sublattice and then the B. I don't remember how I labeled them. Um, if we choose the other sign of M0, it would be the opposite, have to have a little bit more density here. Uh, so this is something which, which could happen. Um, if it happened, it would open up a gap at the two Dirac groups. Okay. Um, what about the, the other mass? Um, Uh, so if we open the gap uh, uh, and we maintain charge neutrality, the Fermi level will stay at zero. Okay. Then we, if we have charge neutrality, graphene basically has to have one total electron per site. Uh, uh, and uh, so that's a constraint that you have an integer number of filled bands. Uh, it forces the Fermi level to be in the gap. Okay. Uh, of course, you could dope it. I mean, these experiments, kind of experiments you're doing, you're varying the charge density by, by pulling it on and off with a gate. Uh, that determines the Fermi energy. Um, good. Other questions? People should just interrupt if you have questions. I'd definitely prefer that. Um, so suppose we take uh, M1 not equal to zero. Okay, what is that? I mean, that's a little more tricky. You know, if we take M1 uh, non-zero, uh, we actually preserve the inversion and AB sublattice symmetry, so it's not a charge density wave, but we break time reversal symmetry. So this one is much less obvious. Uh, this turns out to be something that I'm sure you heard about in John Noel's lecture. Uh, this corresponds to uh, what's often called the quantum anomalous Hall effect. UAHA. This is realized by a famous model, the Haldane model. I'm sure he talked about this. Sorry? Quantum anomalous Hall effect. If you cannot read my handwriting. Okay. Um, and uh, actually, uh, it leads to a, a Hall conductivity, which is again quantized. Um, uh, times, uh, I guess, plus or minus two uh, for graphene if we take into account spin and valley. Okay. Um, uh, not sure what's, what can I do with my, uh, here we go. Maybe it's four, it's probably four actually. Um, times, let's say, sine of M1. Okay, so um, this, is, uh, this is not so obvious, okay? Um, this is unlike what we, this, what's still remaining on the board here, where we really had Landau levels. It's kind of very direct to understand why you get Hall effect. In this Haldane's model, there's no explicit magnetic fields. Um, how does this happen for a small mass, okay? Yeah. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, you're right, you're right, yes, thank you, yeah, you're right. I'll get to it in a second, yeah. yeah. I, I want to explain it, actually, so I'm ahead of myself. Good. Um, okay, so this one, I, it's, it bears thinking about, okay, understanding why. Okay, and again, I'm going to 
come back to uh, uh, lectures you had before, I think, but it's important to remember some of it, okay? Um, I don't know if you did. There was a lot in Jean Loyal's lectures from what I could see. Um, so to explain this, I have to give you a very quick summary of some of the features of topological uh, band theory, okay? Yes? yes? Yeah, I don't want to get into this yet. Yeah, yes, sure. No, don't, don't, don't distract now. Yes, <laughs> later, 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 later. Yes, sure. Okay. Um, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about this. There will be plenty of experimental complications later. We don't want them now. Okay. Um, so you need a, just a quick summary of some of the features of topological band theory, okay? Um, the most important concepts are related to uh, Berry phases. So first let me mention some features which I'm sure you heard about um, and are generic. They don't just apply to graphene, okay? So anytime you have uh, non-degenerate bands, And they could be degenerate too, as long as they don't talk to one another, like spin degeneracy is not going to be important. Um, in that case, we can define uh, block wave functions in this usual way, I mean, R and X, I don't know, I never know what I'm saying. R and X are kind of equivalent whenever, unless I say they aren't. So. Uh, Band states are defined as a, a plane wave times a periodic function, okay? Um, and this periodic function is defined up to a phase, okay? Because we can always multiply the wave function by a phase. That's why we have this non-degeneracy condition. If, if it were degenerate, there would be worse ambiguity. Um, so uh, this phase ambiguity means that phi itself is not so well defined, uh, and even its phase isn't, but you can define what's called the Berry vector potential or very connection which is a function of momentum which is basically the imaginary part of phi of k times the k space gradient of phi of k okay um, so it's the uh, expectation value of this you can think we take the gradient of the wave function we ask how much it changes a little bit in momentum space and how much, and compare it to the old wave function. This is a pure phase because phi is normalized. Um, that's why we take the imaginary part. Of course, this depends on the band and on k. Um, this is not invariant under our just convention, choice of phase of phi. So if I change phi by a phase, then my Vector potential will change uh, by gradient of chi. Okay. So this transformation is just like the transformation of a gauge field in uh, electromagnetism, except everything is in k space instead of real space. Uh, so this A itself doesn't have physical significance, uh, but like a Like for the real vector potential in electromagnetism, its curl does. Um, uh, so we can define the curl in k-space of A. This is gauge invariant, and it's called the Berry curvature. In 2D, there's really only one component. It's D x of a y minus dy of a x, okay, it's a function of k. Um, and this Berry curvature uh, uh, has lots of physical significance, it's directly related to the Hall conductivity. Um, uh, for graphene though, uh, these symmetries have important consequences, so, uh, uh, so under time reversal, uh, 
uh, momentum goes to minus momentum, as we saw. Uh, and this is like a magnetic field. So actually, uh, Bn of minus k is minus uh, Bn of k. So it's odd under time reversal. Um, so if we have time reversal, it has to satisfy this. Uh, and this, in particular, means that if we integrate B over the Brillouin zone, uh, the answer is always 0. That's, in fact, directly related to why the Hall conductivity is 0 when you have time reversal symmetry. Um, but if we have this C2 or inversion symmetry, uh, that also takes k to minus k. And it requires Bn of k is equal to Bn of minus k. Of course, you have these two conditions. There's only one solution. Bn is just 0. Okay. Um, so these two conditions are satisfied for a simple model of graphene. Okay. Uh, it means the Berry curvature is just 0. Um, but there's a caveat. Um, come right back to the beginning. This Berry curvature, Berry gauge field, is only really defined for non-degenerate bands. Uh, and for graphene, the bands touch. Uh, at that touching point, they, they are degenerate. So there's an ambiguity. This B is not really defined exactly at the Dirac points. Okay. Uh, so this allows for the possibility that there's something like a delta function in B at the Dirac points. Uh, so to, to get at that, what one can do uh, is instead of looking at the curl, we don't want to look at the curl right at the Dirac points. That's not well defined. But you know Stokes' theorem. Uh, if you integrate the curl over an area, you get a line integral around a loop. And that's well defined because we can take that loop away from the Dirac point. So you know, here's our Brillouin zone. Here's a Dirac point. We can take a loop like this around it. We take the loop of A dot DL uh, dK around the Dirac point, uh, what you actually find is that this is uh, plus or minus pi. Okay. Uh, why plus or minus? Well, actually, the plus or minus is uh, ambiguous. It depends on your choice of how to, how to write the uh, wave function. Okay. Again, you know, uh, anytime I, if I actually diagonalize the problem here, I, I invite you to do this. It's easy to do for the graphene problem. I have to solve this two by two equation to get this uh, two-component spinner, I have to make a phase choice. And I want to make a phase choice such that phi is continuous around this loop. But there are different ways to do it. If, if you make a phase choice, I can multiply by another phase factor, which winds by 2 pi. Um, and so this thing is actually ambiguous by 2 pi. If you give me a solution that has pi, I give another solution that's minus pi. Okay. Uh, so, you know, naively, if the curl were well-defined, this would be equal to the area integral of the curl. And so we know that there's a Berry curvature delta function in here, which is plus or minus pi. But actually, because time reversal isn't broken, it, it, it's ambiguous whether it's plus or minus pi. So it's really not there. There is no Berry curvature. There's only this uh, line integral. And this line integral, the fact that it's not 0 is related to the stability of the Dirac point. So if we want to get non-zero Berry curvature, we have to break one of these symmetries. As soon as we do that, we get a mass, and then the Berry curvature becomes well-defined. So a very nice calculation you could do. Oh, yeah, I wanted to say some words. This means that the Dirac point is like a vortex, kind of like a vortex. It's like a vortex of the Hamiltonian in momentum space. And so the Dirac point is sort of stable for the same reason that a vortex in a superconductor or a superfluid is stable. Um, so uh, this tells you uh, that there's something almost like Berry curvature in a Dirac point. And we just have to push it a tiny bit to make a lot of Berry curvature. Um, so let's add a Dirac mass. I just consider a one particle Hamiltonian like this, uh, V mu z kx tau x plus V ky tau y plus m tau z. Okay, so here I'm, ra I'm breaking it up into the two valleys. All right? um, just consider mu z could be plus or minus 1, and, and m could be whatever we choose it to be. Okay? Uh, I invite you to calculate this Berry curvature. 
Once we do this, the bands are no longer degenerate, and so it's well-defined everywhere. Uh, you can calculate it in what you get. This is a nice calculation for you kids to do. So this, uh, this function decays as a function of k. If I take k far away, so this is k measured from the Dirac point. If I take k large, it decays like 1 over k cubed, so it goes to 0. Uh, if you were to plot it, you know, b versus k, and it's kind of some nice smooth thing here. Um, but the sign is determined by the sign of the mass and uh, the value, the product of them come in. And the integral of this, you can do the integral. This thing, you'll find that it's pi times sine of uh, mu z m. Yeah. So adding the little mass kind of resolves the ambiguity of this thing, uh, fixes the way you have to uh, uh, assign the phases, um, and you get uh, a nice, well-defined Berry curvature in that vicinity of k space. Um, so coming back to our two phases here, if we took this phase where M0 is uh, positive and M1 is 0, um, and we draw a big picture here of the whole Brillouin zone, what we'd find is we had a little positive bump, let's say, of Berry curvature over here, and a little negative bump over here. Uh, so the total Berry curvature in this region is pi, the total Berry curvature in this region is pi, and the total for the whole system is zero. Okay. Um, this is related to the churn number, C, of a band, which is uh, 1 over 2 pi, the 2D integral of Bn uh, of K. This is well-defined as long as Bn is well-defined everywhere. And this is just zero, so I went into the forbidden region. No. Um, good. Okay. Well, not good for this. Okay. Um, on the other hand, if we take uh, m zero equal to zero and m one positive, we actually reverse the sign. I have two positive bumps. Okay, and you can see that the churn number is now pi for the right valley plus pi for the left valley, pi for the k valley and pi for the k prime valley uh, divided by 2 pi, okay, uh, which is 1. So we get a contribution of 1 to the churn number from both valleys. So this is where this factor of uh, a half is coming from. The degeneracy of the Dirac points, uh, uh, way to, uh, and for the, if we want to calculate the full churn number of all the occupied bands, uh, we should also multiply this by the spin degeneracy, which gives two. Uh, and uh, you know, Jean Noel should have told you that the uh, Hall conductivity is just e squared over h times the sum of the churn number of all the occupied bands. Okay. Um, so in this case, you know, sigma x y over e squared over h is the sum on n of the churn number which we can think of, probably the, the nice way to think about it in this case is we get contributions from spin and from valley. And for in this case, the churn number, the contributions of the churn number is a half uh, from every spin and valley uh, here. And that's two times two times a half, which is two. So um, the message you should have from this is that uh, uh, nearby to graphene, okay, uh, with a small perturbation, very small perturbation to the one particle Hamiltonian, you could make a charge density wave and you could make a, a, a churn insulator with a quantized Hall effect, okay, without applying magnetic fields. Um, there are actually more nearby states. If we consider spin, here I assume these perturbations were spin independent.
We could consider additional perturbations, let's say M2, uh, where uh, I take a valley independent mass, but I uh, allow it to depend on the spin, uh, or a mass that depends on all of them, depends on spin, valley, and the sublattice. Okay. Um, so these states uh, break spin rotation symmetry, so there's some sort of, some sense like magnets, okay? Uh, we can do the symmetry analysis for them. Uh, uh, if, you, uh, if you think about, for example, time reversal, uh, that takes sigma z to minus sigma z, and it leaves tau z invariant. So this M2 term breaks time reversal. In fact, it's easy to understand. You know, if we just think about each spin separately, so sigma z equals plus one is up, sigma z equals minus one is down, this is just, we saw what's a charge density wave. So it's as though we make opposite charge density waves for up and down spin electrons. So going back to our real space picture, uh, we're putting more up spin electrons here, and more down spin electrons here, this is just an antiferromagnet. Sorry, that's probably my computer going crazy. Um, okay. um, what about this M3? Uh, well, M3, you can see, actually doesn't break time reversal because sigma z is odd and mu z is odd. So it doesn't break time reversal. Does it break inversion? Well, actually, it doesn't break uh, inversion either. Um, M3 breaks nothing. Uh, <laughs> breaks no physical symmetries. It breaks spin rotation symmetry, but spin rotation symmetry... Uh, is actually not a physical symmetry, <coughs> although it's pretty damn good for graphene. Uh, in principle, spin orbit coupling only will induce M3. And this is another famous thing. This is actually the Kane Millay model. was the first prediction, I don't know, I'm putting an accent on Malay, I don't think he actually has an accent, um, in Malay model, they actually, the very first prediction of uh, uh, a two-dimensional topological insulator, the quantum spin Hall effect, uh, was uh, proposed for graphene based on this mechanism. It turns out now that spin orbit coupling is extremely weak, kind of appropriate number for this is in the microelectron volt energy scale, so this is really not observable in pure graphene. But we should keep in mind that maybe due to interactions, uh, such a mass could be generated. Okay. Um, so there's lots of potential for interesting states that could occur uh, in graphene by uh, these types of mechanisms. Okay. All right. So this is actually the end of the single layer graphene review. Okay. Just want to summarize the messages. Yeah, fire away. Make a table, yeah, let's see, okay. Tau, Z, Sigma, Z, Mu, Z. Let's, let's see if I can do it. Highly unreliable. All right, time reversal, it is even. Uh, I'll put plus, yeah, yeah even, okay. Uh, sigma is a spin, so spin is odd under time reversal. Mu is valley, the valley takes K to minus K, it's odd under time reversal. Uh, inversion. Uh, changes the sublattice, so sublattice is odd. Spin is actually even under inversion because spin is a pseudo vector, so it does not transform under inversion. Uh, and it takes k to minus k, so this is odd. Okay, so if we make this table for every symmetry, you'll see that uh, two out of three are odd. <laughs> okay, and that's why this is invariant. Um, yeah, now is a good time for questions about any of this. Okay. Um, so uh, the messages you should take is, okay, graphene is really well described by Dirac equation. Uh, everything we're going to do to it, bringing layers of graphene together, applying boron nitride, twisting, all this stuff is low energy effects on graphene. So it's all described very well by Dirac electrons. Um, uh, 
And uh, these Dirac electrons, even though it's you know, quite robust because of the large energy scale, at, at small energies, there are lots of perturbations that could, uh, could occur, lots of interesting symmetry broken, complex orders, topological phases that could arise. Um, unfortunately, they don't in most graphene samples, but by twisting, we're going to manage to get there. Okay. Uh, done with single layer, I want to say a little bit about bilayers. Untwisted. Um, wow. When, how long do I have? When do I get done here? Um, 40 minutes? Yeah, okay. Good. Okay, so um, if an experimentalist tries to make bilayer graphene, it will uh, almost always form in a particular form. You take a layer of graphene like this, honeycomb lattice, the next layer will uh, stack on top of it. And where it actually likes to stack in what's, is in what's called AB or BA stacking. There's an energetic preference to put the next layer of carbon atoms such that one of the carbon atoms sits in the center of the hexagons below. So there are actually two ways to do it. Um, uh, so in my uh, notations, I guess, yeah, just better. The bottom. This site is called an A site, and this is a B site. Um, so one way we could do it, uh, let me try to draw two of these next to each other. Uh, like this. One way we could do it is we could uh, put it like this, the next layer. Okay, so um, if you look at the blue layer, this is the A site of the blue layer. Okay, the A site is not above another atom on the on the on the uh, white layer. Okay, the B site, however, of the blue layer sits above the A site uh, of the white layer. Okay. Okay, so uh, if I call the white layer layer one uh, and the blue layer layer two we would call this A, B st stacking, A1, B2. Um, so there's another way I could do this. Uh, the other way I could do it is to arrange that the A atom of layer two is above the B atom of layer one. So to get from here to here, all I have to really do is I can take uh, this pattern, the blue layer, and shift it down by one carbon-carbon distance. Okay, you see that? Uh, so then uh, my blue layer would look something like this. Okay, and this, this I would call uh, B1, A2. So these two stackings are energetically equivalent. They're what the system wants to do. Okay. If you shake it around, whatever, it's going to do this. You know, slip into one of these patterns. Um, theorists like to imagine a, another ordering, okay, which we can manage to get, um, the easy one, because it's really easy th in theory, is to just put them right on top of one another. Okay. You could imagine this. I'm just drawing it slightly shifted for the sake of it so that you can see both, uh, both hexagons. Okay. So this we would call, you could call AA or BB, doesn't really matter. Every carbon atom is on top of every other carbon atom. Okay. So this is just a straight vertical displacement. This is actually the worst possible stacking. Okay. This is the system wants to avoid this thing. Okay. What we're going to see in twisted bilayer graphene is because of the twist, it can't maintain either stacking everywhere. There's going to be some regions where it looks like this, some regions where it looks like this, and some regions where it looks like this. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is all, you know, gives you lots of super fun problems to do, okay, uh, which I'll leave as exercises to you. I, I intend to provide some notes if I can get my act together, um, notes that are readable.
Okay, so this is kind of, this is a simple problem you can try to work out. And we already worked out, the, everybody's worked out, I hope, the single layer graphene type binding model. Um, we can do, try to do the next thing, the next step is to add this tunneling between the two layers. So for the single layer type binding model, we had to have a, uh, we end up with a two by two matrix because we have the A and the B sublattices. Now we're gonna have a four by four matrix because we have an A sublattice, B sublattice, layer one, layer two. Okay. Uh, again, I, I emphasize that for all this, uh, everything, putting layers together, et cetera, we never need to go back to that type binding model for graphene. We just, we're, it's fine to just stick with the Dirac equation. Okay. Um, so uh, if you wanna study this uh, AB or BA spectrum, we can write a, uh, one particle Hamiltonian, which is basically, let's look in the vicinity of the, the K Dirac point. So we have this uh, Dirac spectrum, K dot tau, uh, for both, both layers, bless you. And uh, again, I'm gonna use these, uh, I like to use these Pauli matrices. Okay, in principle, I should write this for layer one and layer two. Introduce a new, yet another Pauli matrix, gamma, okay, where gamma z equals one is the is layer one, and gamma equals minus one is layer two, okay. And now we want to include terms which tunnel. So we include a T prime, so it's like an AB tunneling. Uh, it should take us from sublattice uh, A to sublattice B. So that's like a raising operator in this uh, sublattice space, tau plus, and it should take uh, us from layer uh, two to layer one, let's say. Oh, I did this uh, gamma minus plus tau minus gamma plus. Okay, and I don't guarantee that I have the signs right. It doesn't matter. It's all a matter of convention whether I told you these signs correctly. Okay. Um, so this is a nice problem, okay. Uh, four by four matrix, can you diagonalize it? Can you? Do you think you can? <laughs> so this is, you could think about this as going from A1 to B2, and this is a Hermitian conjugate. It goes from B2 to A1. Okay. Um, so it turns out you can find all the levels of this. The levels uh, have a nice formula. There are going to be four of them. Kind of complicated formula. I invite you to, to work this out. You can do this, you know, by hand if you're smart about the basis you choose this. Or Mathematica will figure it out for you, of course. But it's much less satisfying. If you actually plot this, this is a formula for epsilon squared. So you have a plus minus sign that gives two values for epsilon squared. You can take the positive and negative square roots. That's four levels. They look like this. Um, there's a pair of gapped bands. And then there's another pair of gapless bands that touch like this. And they all become linear far away. Okay. This energy here, this is uh, T prime. And in the vicinity of this point, it's actually quadratic. Uh, v squared, k squared over t prime. Um, so this is a funny thing. It's a little bit like the original Dirac point where we had a touching of conduction and valence bands. Again, we have a touching of conduction and valence bands, but now they touch quadratically instead of uh, linearly. Okay. So this is a kind of semi-metal. Uh, but even, even weirder semi-metal than a single layer graphene. Okay. Um, if we do the other case, that's actually easier. So this occurs for either AB or BA stacking. 
if we do AA stacking, okay, it's very simple. Our one particle Hamiltonian is just You just can either tunnel, AA, excuse me, you either tunnel up or down from the layers and you don't change the sublattice. Okay. So the gammas and the taus don't talk to one another. It's very simple. We either, you either get, uh, you can sort of diagonalize these separately. This has eigenvalues equal to uh, plus or minus tau prime. So you just get a copy. You can think it's bonding and anti-bonding orbitals, symmetric and anti-symmetric orbitals between the two layers. One shifts up, one shifts down. Uh, so you end up with one Dirac cone centered, shifted up by T prime AA, and another one shifted down by T prime AA. Uh, so at charge neutrality, things are quite different. You actually have uh, a lot of density of states. This one, you know, you, both of them form little Fermi circles, so it's actually a metal. But again, for a bilayer, this never happens, okay? You can't form this, it's not structurally stable. Um, uh, good, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, well, we know it because we try to grow it. If you're, you know, if you did a DFT calculation, you would know the structural stability. It makes sense, you know, you're pushing two electron clouds against one another. They don't want to push, sit on top of one another. And if the electrons are negatively charged, they repel. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Uh, okay, I did two different T primes. So in this case, this is the amplitude to hop from the A site on one layer to the B site on the layer above it, directly above it, okay? We can do a more refined thing. In fact, there's some chance for the electron to hop sideways to some nearby other sites, but whereas here, it's just vertical hopping A to A or B to B, which should be the same, okay? So this is a s single site term. Um, other, other questions? Yeah. Yeah. In this case, that's well defined uh, because, uh, so it's a discrete system. There have to be, you know, there's kind of a, there are two, if you want, standing wave, wave functions that form in the z direction. Uh, with the AA stacking, there's a simple symmetry. Uh, you just can reflect the system from up to down. That's not really true here. Um, so there is not a z to minus z symmetry in AB. There's a different symmetry. There's an inversion symmetry. If you take z to minus z and you twist, uh, so it's a little more complicated in this case. That's why it doesn't look so clear. Does that address your question? Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so again, in the spirit of what messages should you take from this, you should take that uh, AB and BA stacking are uh, have very different electronic structure from AA stacking. Um, this is a, a semi-metal, uh, sort of much more insulating than this. If we could sort of let charges freely choose where they want to go, the electrons would prefer to be here. They like to be in the metal, form little puddles. Uh, but the lattice wants the opposite. It wants this thing. Okay. Um, fortunately, graphene is quite rigid. Uh, so uh, it takes a long distance for the lattice to really relax um, and try to form as much of the AB regions as it can. Um, uh, then we'll come back to that, okay. Uh, so for, for the moment, I want you to think about, uh, we're gonna start thinking about twisted lattices, uh, and we're gonna assume these twists are rigid, okay. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna use some audiovisual aids. We're gonna start talking about twisting.
It's all pretty bright colors. I'm not sure you need to do this. But. Okay, I'm going to have to figure out how to turn that back on. So it's, it's on you. Okay. Uh, I'm okay at drawing a honeycomb lattice. It gets pretty hard if you start having to draw twisted ones. Okay, so... Um, uh, uh, Dimitri told you about uh, how they make these twisted bilayer systems. They take a single layer, rip off a piece, bring it over, twist, put it down. It's kind of miraculous. This crap works. I don't, it's amazing. Okay. Theorists can do it pretty easily. So here's a honeycomb lattice. Actually, it was two of them, and I twisted. You can do this really nicely in Keynote. Um, let's take a look over here. Uh, I twisted it around some region here. So here's maybe the center of rotation. I don't know. It's just one of these things. Um, so this hexagon's twisted a little bit. I started with AA stacking so that you couldn't see that there were two. Okay, uh, And it stays AA stacking here because the angle is pretty small. Um, uh, but you get this very interesting moiré pattern, which is a name for a type of interference pattern. Does anyone know where moiré comes from? We're in France. You guys should know moiré. Somebody. Somebody tell me. It's uh, not a pattern exactly. Uh, it comes from silk manufacturing. So uh, uh, there was a particular style of fabric. Silk is very thin, involving multiple layers of silk fabric. And, and this fabric, you know, you can have sort of taffeta dresses and outfits for pompous dandies back in the Victorian times, I guess. And they, were, they, they made these moiré patterns by being slightly misaligned. Okay. Um, incidentally, uh, yeah, Lucille should know all about this probably. Silk manufacturing was centered in, uh, in Lyon back in the day. Um, anyway, okay, so um, here's what this thing looks like. When you look at these patterns, you can see, uh, I'll sort of try to explain it a little bit more. Um, we end up with some region which is AA-like, and that will sort of repeat. But in between, if we look carefully, we'll find regions like here uh, where it's AB-like. Okay. And you find another region over here where it's actually BA-like, and I don't, you probably can't tell, but... Um, so this is actually six degrees, okay? This pretty big twist compared to where all the excitement is happening. Uh, uh, so Dimitri was showing you patterns at one degree. What happens when you twist it less? So here, okay, yeah, here's this pattern. So you can easily see there's a sort of super lattice um, where uh, things look more or less the same. It forms like a larger triangular lattice. If we take a, a smaller twist, the lattice gets bigger. Okay, um, And just empirically, you do this. Here's two degrees. It's still bigger than the excitement. These two degree things don't behave very anomalously. Here's one degree. This is what these things actually look like. You start running into problems with the resolution of my plot. The lines are too thick. Uh, <laughs> But uh, this is the kind of length scale you should have in mind for these experiments, okay, where everybody is studying these twisted bilayers. Really, really a, a lot of sites here. Um, it's a huge unit cell, and that's the length scale. Uh, okay, that's enough of this for now. Yeah. Uh, let me, let me, let me. It doesn't matter, but uh, I'll, <laughs> it doesn't matter. It turns out it doesn't matter, okay? But, but let me, I've just shown you pictures because I can't draw pictures. Now we'll go back and get more serious, okay? If I can figure out how to make this thing go up. Uh, make the lights go on, what is it, uh, full? You'll do it. Okay, and this thing's got to go up. Okay, and then I have to hide this. Good, good. Okay. Uh, yeah, all right. Um, okay, so I will do my very best to draw something related to a moiré pattern. All right, so very simple. So let's imagine we start with, uh, I'm always going to think about starting with two perfectly aligned patterns. Okay, so I guess if you want to think about it, you can think about it as starting with AA. That's sort of my preference. In, in practice, it doesn't really matter. 
okay? Um, for reasons we'll get to. So I'm not gonna draw the honeycomb lattice. I'm gonna just draw, think about these points as being the centers of the hexagons. So the Brave lattice of, of graphene is, uh, is just a triangular lattice. So these are the hexagon centers. And they form some set of points like this. Just draw one hexagon to give you an idea. Okay. Um, so let's imagine I take one of these layers. So they're, right now I have they're two right on top of one another. You can see. Can you tell they're two right on top of one another? I very carefully drew both. No, okay, um, apparently not. So let's take this site uh, and twist the top layer uh, around this site by a, a little angle theta. Okay. Um, and I wanna follow a vertical line, which should be perfectly vertical, and of course it isn't. Jesus, <laughs> it's really bad, it's really bad. Oh my God, it's terrible. Okay, here we go. Excuse me. Whoop, exceptionally bad, all right, there we go. Um, what's gonna happen? Well, this site here in the top layer will get shifted a little bit to the left. It gets rotated a little bit to the left. This one will get rotated twice as much to the left. This one three times as much to the left, okay? So they're all rotating a little bit. Um, so, you know, trigonometry uh, will tell you that uh, if I go a distance uh, Ly here, this shift is theta times Ly if theta is small. I mean, in general, it's sine, you know, some tangent or something times Ly. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, if this becomes equal to the carbon carbon to this uh, distance in this direction, okay? It's not the carbon-carbon spacing. It has to become equal to the distance between the centers. So remember, these are the centers of hexagons. This distance here. Uh, it's better if I draw the hexagons. If, if I go far enough up, this will get pushed all the way to this, this place, okay? Um, and this distance is actually, uh, A times square root of three, okay? It's bigger than, but usually we define the carbon-carbon spacing as A, okay? Uh, so if theta times L Y is A square root of three, uh, then up there I'll find another AA region, okay? Now, in fact, generically, uh, I can't go an arbitrary distance L Y. I just have to go discrete set of uh, lattice sites up there, and this will never be perfectly satisfied for a generic angle. What this means is a twisted pattern is actually not periodic, okay? Um, so generically, for generic theta, this is actually not periodic. It's only quasi-periodic. So this twisted bilayer graphene is actually a kind of like a quasi-crystal, okay? Um, uh, and this is horrible, okay? Maybe some of you have advisors who worked on quasi-crystals or something, but they're horrible, it's horrible. <laughs> we don't want this thing, okay? Um, Quasi-periodic system, why is it bad? There's no Bloch's theorem, okay? We can't really talk about bands in momentum space. There is no momentum space. Uh, it's a very subtle how these things behave. Uh, Quasi-periodic systems, can have uh, electron localization a bit like Anderson localization, but weirder, uh, it's horrible stuff. We don't want it, okay? Um, but you can see from, from the pictures I showed you of the moiré patterns, it sure looks pretty darn periodic, okay? Um, and basically for very small angles, uh, you can get extremely close to periodic, okay? Um, and uh, so it turns out, and I'll sort of try to explain why. 
with theta much less than one, it's extremely good approximation uh, that this is actually periodic. And so we can recover Bloch theorem, uh, the form of Bloch's theorem, even, even for uh, angles where the structure is actually incommensurate, non-periodic. Okay. Um, So uh, that is subtle and tricky, and that'll be part of something I want to explain. Um, you saw in this, uh, uh, so um, how do we think about what, what happens uh, in this bilayer system? Okay. Well, first we could just try to guess, okay? If for a very small twist angle, the system's gonna kind of locally look like BA and AB regions and A regions. The BA and AB regions uh, should be sort of semi-metallic. They have a very flat dispersion here. The AA and AB regions look metallic. How do we match these things up? Uh, it's complicated and weird. Okay. Um, a a simple-minded picture, uh, which is not quite right, but is still good for getting intuition, is to think about uh, Think about weak tunneling. So imagine we turn the tunneling off and we just twist the twist the two bilayers. Okay. Well, what happens? Well, okay. So um, it's easiest in that case we can easily think in momentum space. We have our uh, roll-on zone like this. We start with a Dirac point here and a Dirac point here. We twist it a little bit, not too much. Uh, I like to think about it symmetrically. Let's twist the upper layer in the clockwise direction and the lower layer in the anti-clockwise direction. So both the Dirac points move. One of them will move here, and the other one will move down to here. Okay, so it'll be the top layer and the bottom layer. This is greatly exaggerated how much it moves. Remember the angle uh, in these experiments is one degree. Okay, it moves a really tiny amount. Um, so uh, let's imagine we take a cut in K space along a line like this, okay? And plot the energy versus KY. Uh, so the Dirac point in the upper layer occurs somewhere over here. There's a dispersion like this. So this is layer one, let's say. And the Dirac point in the lower layer has a dispersion like this. It has its uh, Dirac point over here. So the two Dirac cones are shifted in KY. Um, now we turn on tunneling. But tunneling uh, allows the states in the upper and the lower layer to mix, and they'll, level, they'll undergo level repulsion. But they only can really level repel when they're degenerate. Okay? So the main level repulsion happens here at these touching points. Uh, the bottom is bad, I'm sorry. Hard. Red, red, red. Not enough red. Um, so what'll happen is these points will split something like this. And these will split also something like this. There's no lever repulsion here. These are just states in the same layer. Okay. These these repel. Uh, so let's think about this. So what is what are these uh, distances? Okay. Well, again, our trigonometry, this is k. For a small angle, this shift is k times theta over 2. Okay. Uh, in this graphing, twisted bilayer graphing business, people like to define a moiré wave vector, which is k times theta. All right. Or k over 2, 2k two sine theta over 2 like that. Um, so this shift is actually k theta over 2. All right. So then the energy here is just v times k theta over 2, I guess. Okay. Um, what about this level repulsion? This shift here 
is proportional to the tunneling. It's something like T prime. Okay. So you can see the effect of T prime is to push, uh, push down this uh, uh, conduction band and push up the valence band. Okay. And if you very naively just extend, uh, this is really perturbative, you imagine this uh, extends to, to T prime big enough that it gets pushed all the way down to zero, you can see we get a pretty flat band would be highly compressed when T prime is of order V times K theta. Okay. Um, so that turns out to be true, okay? Much more, much better than you would expect from this naive argument. Is there a question? Yeah. Um, if you write that kind of this will be not great. Sure. Yeah, this is only a hand-waving argument, right? Yeah, yeah. Is it a comment or a question? Sounds like a comment. No comments, only questions. Yeah, it's all right. I allow it. Okay. Um, so these are just motivations. There are a couple of very loose things that I told you, okay, which have to be sharpened up. Uh, I think that so one issue is that these structures are generically quasi-periodic, not periodic, okay? Um, but I, I claim that basically you can recover uh, uh, in a, bless you, in a sensible way, periodicity and Bloch's theorem, okay? This is not obvious, um, but it turns out that it's possible to do this in an extremely well-defined way, which still allow you, what I mean by that is that you can write down equations that allow you to do band structure calculations for arbitrary theta. Um, uh, and second, uh, I said by this very hand-waving argument, you get flat bands, compressed bands. Um, how compressed do you actually get? Uh, that's a good question. Um, and to answer that, you really need to be able to do a, a full calculation, okay? Um, so, uh, so I started like five minutes late, right? So in principle, we have like 15 minutes, including discussions maybe. Um, it's a little bit of a bridging point. Um, so let me at least tell you where we're going, and I'm not sure how I want to go there. Um, so the, what we, what we need to do is actually solve both of these two problems together, figure out how to really define the, the band structure of uh, Moray graphene. Um, and this was really done, uh, I give really credit to a beautiful paper of Bistritzer and McDonald, uh, which I mentioned before, it's 2011 PNAS. Um, they figured out how to derive what's called, what they, I think most people call a continuum model. There are probably 50 papers, uh, 20, 30 papers refining this continuum model now with lots of small changes, but all the conceptual ideas are here. Um, uh, everything else is a, is a detail. Um, they show how to, how to really define this periodic problem, which obeys Bloch's theorem in a sharp way, allows to do calculations. Uh, and from those calculations, you can see that you get these flat bands. Um, and uh, I think what I want to do is show you a few more pictures, because right, actually trying to derive things is going to be bad in the little amount of time, and then we can let people ask questions. Um, Um, so, uh, 
Here's a, a little bit more nicely drawn picture uh, showing kind of what I, I drew for you before. Um, we start, if you start with a single uh, graphene Brillouin zone and you twist two copies, one up and one down, the Dirac point of one moves up a little bit, the other moves down a little bit. Um, we'll, we'll see that these two points correspond to corners of a, of a new Brillouin zone, which is a Brillouin zone of the Moiré pattern. Moiré pattern is big, so the Brillouin zone is small. This is a small thing. And the important feature is that the, this Moiré Brillouin zone is located entirely within some, some circle around one of the Dirac points. It's very far from the other Dirac point. Um, Anytime you have electrons in a periodic structure, like a Moiré structure, an electron can brag scatter off of that pattern. So it can, it can change its momentum by picking up a, a reciprocal lattice vector of the pattern. All you scatterers should be comfortable with that. These, these wave vectors, though, are they're pretty small. They're like a wave vector crossing the zone here. So for an electron to, remember, all the low energy electrons are located near the Dirac points. In between, this thing shoots way up to eight electron volts or something. So uh, important question to ask is we have low energy electrons in this valley, low energy electrons over here. Can they talk to one another? So the only way they can talk to one another is by Bragg scattering uh, many, many times. They have to scatter, you know, in this picture you could scatter once from here to here to here to here to here to here to here, maybe six or seven times or something to get over to the other valley. Um, uh, and it, to do that, I have to scatter through much uh, more energetic states, which are extremely non-resonant. So this is a very improbable thing. Um, and, and this is a, a key, uh, key step, is that the Bragg scattering off of this periodic pattern does not mix the two valleys. So we can consider the band structure entirely of these Moiré patterns separately between one valley and the other. Um, actually, the picture is even better than what I showed you. This is a realistic picture, OK? Uh, this is one degree, all right? That's the size of this Moiré Brillouin zone. All right, you're never getting over there. Um, if you're, you know, the, you'll find some theorists who are just can't accept this, and they gotta sit down and try to do the whole type binding model for the thing. You know, I showed you the Moiré picture. There's like 10,000 sites or something in that cell. It's a complete waste of time. Uh, okay, um, don't waste your time. Uh, so I guess I, I'm going to have to postpone until next time, actually, how you formulate this continuum model. But the continuum model has a huge advantage that it allows us to forget about this gigantic Brillouin zone. And we'll do everything in this tiny little Brillouin zone here, OK? That's just a huge savings, OK? We directly confront the physics on the energy scale, the length scale of the Moiré pattern. Um, and these are the original calculations from this Bistritzer McDonald model, um, which we'll go into. Uh, remember what I talked about uh, the first day on, on Monday. Um, there's a sort of trivial effect uh, of band narrowing anytime you have a, a super lattice or a periodic potential. You just shrink the size of the Brillouin zone, and so you cut a band in a smaller region in K space. Um, and consequently, if you have a band that disperses linearly, uh, if I shrink the Brillouin zone size by half, I shrink the energy scale by half. Okay. So if you look on the scale of all the bands in the problem, you're seeing that. These are at Different angles, this is five degree, one degree, half a degree. You see the energy scale, here is 1,000, here is 100, here is 20, okay? Um, that's that effect. But remember, we needed some magic. The magic is evident here. This is not a magic angle. Um, and you can see all the bands are kind of roughly the same energy width here. Um, they're just, their width would be given roughly by the Dirac velocity divided by the unit cell size of the Moiré pattern. Here at this magic angle, there's something bizarre. Most of the bands are like this, but these ones are at the Fermi energy are completely flat on this scale. Okay. Um, uh, go away again, and you get something not so flat. Actually, there's another. This is another magic kind of magic angle, close to one anyway. Um, uh, so uh, early days, there was some work from uh, Antonio Castroneto and. Uh, other people, um, probably Paco Ganea, any of the old time graphing people, um, they already knew there would be some band narrowing uh, uh, from these effects as you made the Moiré angle smaller. But the most natural speculation was the bands would just continuously get narrower and narrower and narrower. The crazy weird thing is that's not the case. Actually, the bandwidth oscillates. Um, 
So there's these magic angles where things get very flat, and in between it gets big again. Uh, how about this? Um, <laughs> okay, I, I, the axis is uh, so the the first magic angle happens at about one degree. So this is basically the velocity. One finds there's a if you define it this way. I'm not sure this is the best way to define it. Um, it's one way you can define it. The velocity. Uh, so I'll explain all these things uh, tomorrow, I guess. But um, turns out that uh, you could sort of see it from that picture. At every angle, there's still Dirac points but the Dirac velocity changes a lot. And at some point, the Dirac velocity vanishes. That's what, how Bistritzer and McDonald define the first magic angle. That's about one degree, 1.1 degree or something. The second one happens at about half a degree, and then it happens again at some smaller angle, and it keeps happening. Uh, uh, the sequence seems to be something like angle of order one over n, um, but in fact, there's not much analytic understanding of it. Um, they're really great question. Theorists would love to have a simple answer. Why does this happen? I still don't have a simple answer <laughs> after thinking about it for too long. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, I mentioned, uh, I'll, uh, so this will be part of the story next time, but um, the, the, Big achievement of this uh, Bistritz or McDonald model is to turn two small parameters into one, one dimensionless parameter. So there, I mentioned already in the first lecture, there are uh, kind of two small parameters in this problem. So one problem is, one small parameter is the inner layer tunneling. It's much smaller than the bandwidth or the carbon-carbon hopping. Uh, the other small parameter is, is the angle, but if we, it's better to phrase this in terms of energies the energy uh, associated with this wave vector shift, V k theta, that was that vertical energy on the previous plot, is also much smaller than the bandwidth. Um, so these are both dimensionful parameters. Um, there's a dimensionless parameter, which is uh, T prime divided by V k theta. And that's what this alpha is, more or less, up to, up to a normalization constant. That's what alpha is. Okay. Um, so what, what uh, Bistritzer and McDonald did, and I'll show you kind of how that works the next time, is they were able to uh, formulate the problem in the way that these two dimensionless parameter, dimension full parameters completely go away. Okay. Actually, there's a, you can form two dimensionless parameters, interesting, you know? There's T prime over T and V k theta over T. Okay. You might think they're two dimensionless parameters. But when these two parameters are both small, we eliminate these two in favor of only one. Okay, that's the achievement, okay? Um, and this, even though T prime is small and VK theta are small, this doesn't have to be small. So the magic angle regime, wh when alpha is actually small, that's the trivial regime. That's weak coupling. That's a drawing I drew. As, when the angle gets small, K theta gets small, alpha gets big. That's where all the weird, crazy stuff happens. All the magic angles are alpha of order one and bigger. Okay, and that's why they happen here. Um, I want to show one more thing, which I think is the next slide. Okay. Um, so you may wonder what's going on. This is probably not going to explain what's going on, but it's just so cool. Um, Chun Xiao knows what it is because he was involved in this work. You can ask him what it is. Um, so I mentioned what Bistritzer and McDonald showed here uh, was that the Dirac velocity vanishes at these magic angles. Uh, so you might ask, you know, that's only looking near the Dirac points at the, in this mini uh, Brillouin zone. What's happening more broadly? Well, it's like fireworks. Um, so you can, uh, what this is a plot of is we start at some alpha that's relatively small, so this means large angle. Uh, and what's going to be plotted are the locations of Dirac points in the, in the low energy band structure. So they're very simple, they're just really two of them. The, the, the others are copies, just like in graphene. They're the two original Dirac points. They, you can think of them as coming one from the upper layer and one from the lower layer. Um, but as you start reducing the angle, uh, more Dirac points appear in the middle of the zone. They appear in pairs. The, the color is somehow their sign. And they do this, they come out, move around, some more appear in the middle, come firing over to the edge, zoom along, stop, oh shit, I can't, 
can't pause. Uh, sorry, let's do it again. It's fun to watch. I don't know how to pause this thing. Oh, there we go. It goes fast at the key point. Increasing, increasing, degrading. It's like fireworks. Uh, there's the it. Boom. And that is actually the magic angle that Bistreets or McDonald have. Right, these three extra drag points come in and bash into the original drag point. That's when the velocity vanishes. But they just go right through, they come back out again. So you, if you start looking at the whole Brillouin zone, you see that there's actually a lot more magic than just the magic that, that these guys uh, saw. And I don't think anybody fully understands the magic <laughs> at this point, but uh, from a band structure point of view. But, uh, all right, Mr. Organizer, I see you have another question for us, but maybe the students should ask questions first. I think that's all I want to say for today, so let's, uh, let's, let's uh, any, any questions at this point? So. <laughs> students first. Oh, when I said large theta here, it was still tiny. Uh, well, what you were talking about here was uh, an angle of flight, which is really much, much smaller than one. Oh, well, that's because we use degrees. Uh, five is much smaller than, uh, than 180. So you should, you, you should use radians, okay? So that the proper units is uh, degrees uh, divided by 180 times pi. So about basically degrees divided by 60. So it is small. Um, yeah. So, so one thing I don't think you can answer is, so why would the flat band be confused with the tumble signal interaction? Oh. <laughs> 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 Wait. Wait, and I will not explain it, but you still wait. <laughs> <laughs> the short answer is nobody knows, but if you can explain it, then you probably get some nice science papers. Yeah. I, I have a similar question to this. Uh, okay. Ah. Is the second direct on the periodic theory sort of can I think about that as a cancellation of the experimental coupling? No, no, okay, yeah, that's a great question. So um uh all this theory, including this continuum model, assumes complete rigidity of the lattice. Yeah. Okay. Um there's a simple uh correction of that where you allow the lattice to relax a little bit vertically but that doesn't change the periodicity in any way. So that's, that's very simple. That's actually important. Um, uh, the more subtle thing is relaxation in the plane. Okay. Um, so imagine you make a really tiny angle, like not one degree, but one-tenth of a degree or a hundredth of a degree. Okay. Uh, now, it's almost constant in space. If I look in some region, you know, a very large region, it'll, it'll just look like I've uh, shifted a little bit. Uh, so what'll happen? Well, there'll be some AA region and the, the system doesn't like it. It will actually shrink the AA region and the AB region will get larger. And in principle, what the system would like to do is make very large AB and BA regions, make domains of that and, and remove the AA regions as much as possible. They will just become domain walls. You know. um, so that when that happens, exactly what angles that happens at, uh, is a question of uh, competing elastic energies for deforming the sheet within the plane and the binding energies between the plane. So because it's a van der Waals bonded system, these, these bonds between the plane are, are relatively weak and graphene is one of the stiffest lattices we know for in-plane deformations. So that only occurs at quite small angles. Um, uh, we know it occurs at an angle like a tenth of a degree. Okay, there are experiments that show that, uh, that it's extremely non-uniform structure. You, measured using you know, AFM or STM. Uh, exactly where that happens is probably not that far below the first magic angle. Maybe already by half a degree, these are big effects. Uh, I don't think anyone knows. Um, uh, uh, there are you know, many theoretical estimates. You can try to do ab initio DFT. 
things. Uh, around one degree, it seems to still be pretty rigid, and these effects are not that big. Um, but it's right at the borderline. Yeah. All right. Any more student questions before? Okay, you're a student now. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, when you're looking at, and if you should look here in this higher minus sign, the three minus uh, that you're looking at and the actual equivalent of it, I use the satellite on the, and the electron sort of hypnotic is one of the most minus sign for them. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Even I know the answer. <laughs> Even I know the answer. It's, yes, so they have an opposite. It's two, indeed. Okay. Yeah, and uh, you know, for an expert like yourself, the way it works is uh, uh, you, there's, you can think about a k dot p theory around the Dirac point. Uh, so the linear theory is linear. The next term will be quadratic. And the quadratic has to have a winding two. Okay, um, so that's why. That's why. Yes. Yeah, I mean, this tells you it should be flat isotropically around K. It doesn't tell you around the whole zone. Uh, so, I, I mean, I have a hand-waving picture, but it's very hand-waving, which is, you could see in this movie, let's play it again, because it's just so much fun, that there are a lot of Dirac points, and... Uh, they, they can ask questions while the movie is happening. So, yeah. Oh, no, no, not you. Not you. Uh, I'm still answering this question. I'm still answering the question. Okay. The, uh, uh, you know, throughout this range of angles, this looks like a big range, but it's, you know, maybe a tenth of a degree or less. You know. um, in that range of angles, there are actually a lot of Dirac points. Every time there's a Dirac point, the conduction and the valence band touch. So if you think about the conduction and valence band as sheets, they're like, uh, you can imagine, I, I have this at home. You have a pillow, which uh, is kind of large and flat for maybe sitting on the floor or something. People sew them together by putting buttons and, and a piece of yarn in several places, that keeps the thing from coming apart. Uh, so you imagine these two sheets are sort of tied together at, I don't know, 12 points or something in here, they're even more, 18 maybe maximum or something. So they can't get very far from one another because they, these points keep sticking them together. That's sort of the hand-waving picture, why it's flat everywhere. But they're more fancy. Okay, monsieur. This one? Yeah. Well, it's a matter of definition, but so, oh, there, there, there. In this plot, the way the way Bistritzer and McDonald define the magic angle is uh, when these these parameters equal to zero. This. Yeah, that's one degree. This is like half a degree. Ah, the others are lower. Yeah, because alpha, sorry, I wrote it. Alpha is T prime over VK theta. K theta is linear in theta, so it's one over theta. Uh, this is already one degree, and these are smaller than one degree. Uh, I think Dimitri has seen the second one, maybe. Uh, some evidence, uh, that's rumor, rumor has it, no? Somebody saw a second one? Anyway, I don't know. Maybe my student may have been misinforming me. I, I mean, I'm a little, I, I'm pretty sure that these don't exist. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is again in the model where the, the lattice is rigid and we know it's not rigid, the discussion I gave to his question here. Uh, once we get over here, I think that this uh, lack of rigidity of the lattice is gonna mess everything up. It'll be very different. So maybe this one exists. In fact, just about every experiment that you've heard of, that you've seen about magic angle graphene is this, just this. Angles maybe vary a tiny bit, uh, but not that much. Because as you can see from the movie, it's not really one exact angle. There's some range where things are flat, but it's, it's not big. Oh, much easier. Yeah, yeah, much easier to do the larger angles. Yeah. You can have all the information in the experiment, and it's very, very, it's completely 
And those have been studied a lot before. Um, Which, sorry? Yeah, it hasn't. Large alpha has not been invested. But I, I mentioned some of it has. Uh, so there are experiments on you know, nominal twist angles of something like 0.1 or even smaller. Uh, but, but those samples are very inhomogeneous um, by construction, basically. They, the lattice relaxes, so they're not described by this model. Uh, that's also interesting. It's a different story. I think, again, not that well understood. Lots of stuff for theorists to work on if you really want to, and experimentalists to study. Okay, I should stop. Um, I think we have to eat, no?